Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly discussion series that's hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in collaboration with U of M Detroit Center, Unique Voices in Films, and CMN TV. I'm your host, We Am Nemo, and my guest today is Emily Porter. Hello, Emily. Hello. So, Emily studied in Iraq, Beirut, Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, Russian Federation, the United States, and Austria. She is an activist in human rights and in preserving antiquities and cultural heritage. A dedicated researcher on religion and art, Emily is the editor of Memoirs of, um, Memoirs of Maria Theresa Asmar, which has also been translated into Arabic. So, Emily, I met you exactly 10 years ago. Absolutely, yes. It was lovely that time. Yes, it was lovely because I was introduced, um, well, to you, <laughs> but also yes. <laughs> to um, the memoir series, Memoirs of a Babylonian Princess, which, yeah. as you had said at your lecture at the um, at Shenandoah at the Chaldean yeah. Cultural Center, uh, yeah. interestingly, that you're back here ten years later. Um, talking <laughs> about this. I wish I was in person, you know, not the museum, but that's the only thing we can One do. One of these days. Yeah, maybe <laughs> who knows if we're lucky yeah, enough yeah. to have you again here. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it was an amazing lecture that introduced me to uh, Maria Teresa Esmar, uh, along with her memoir series. And I ended up purchasing um, the book. Which right. one? Uh, because there's this... I got, I got memoirs of a Babylonian. No, yeah, yeah. This is, this is published, I think, in America. Yes, I think it's by a U.S. publisher. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, so we will talk uh, a little bit about that and then t tell people the lecture series that's coming up, which is sort of like yeah. a combined okay. lecture series and book club. Yeah. So, you know what, before we start, just tell us a little bit about your history and then how you came across uh, this particular book. Well, my history is very long, so I'm not going to start with my history. <laughs> Uh, just, just to be very brief, I come from a mixed marriage. My father is an English, British from the Lake District in uh, here in uh, in UK, and uh, my mum she is half uh, Syrian Lebanese, half Iraqi. Her mum from Basra, her father from Halab and from Beirut. I was born in Baghdad. And then I lived my, uh, you know, when I was just little, my dad had a job in Kirkuk, which is uh, north uh, east of Iraq, and very famous city, still is very controversial as well. So I was there until I was six, seven years old, and then we moved back to Baghdad. And after that, I carried on with my studies, and then I was... Uh, you know, I had a, a scholarship to go and study abroad, and I didn't miss it. So we used traveling to Lebanon, to Syria, to see the other part of the family, or staying in Iraq, traveling to Basra, where my grandmother originally from. So that's a bit of about my my history. It's, it's a, so I studied art, and then I carried on uh, until. You know, I I start to be a professional and working, finding jobs and everything. I was very lucky anyway in my life. I feel I I combined two culture together. So culture never fight, uh, only military fights. So culture they integrate into each other and they uh, and they enhance each other and make it richer actually and and. So I enjoy that. I enjoy my different culture. I really enjoy it. It's really give me more power, more self-confidence. So that's a bit of, about me. I'm retired now. I lectured in, in many places, many countries, so I won't go through it. Uh, lectured on art and history of art. I worked at Iraqi Museum for 15 years. And uh, the things I could mention, which is really I like to... Part of my book, Samson Wildman, it's a novel, was translated by Newcastle University. It's about the massacre in 1915 by the Turkish, Iranian, and Kurdish uh, during the First World War. This is, I'm very happy with it. Another book, which is another, it's a novel called Dabul. It's been 
considered as the history of Baghdad as well and being taught in many uh, European different uh, universities. So wow. that's the two things. I, yeah, I would so you, have, you have a large um, work of publications. Um, I do, I have no, yeah, yeah, I have, yes. Yes, yes, I do. I do. yes um, but including the mem uh, I'm, I'm sorry the title of your book is memoirs of maria Teresa asmar yes well, yes yes the editing so tell us how you came across because this is an interesting interesting story i was so lucky to come across it you know i've never heard of her i have no clue who she was never never mentioned anyway in, in iraq nobody knows her nobody mentioned her nobody talk about her she's completely neglected and so I was in Geneva visiting a friend with my son in September. So I was visiting one of my friends who is a writer and he is he had a issue, he had a, a magazine called Mesopotamia. I used to publish articles in it. So the minute I entered his house, you know, I saw loads of book, which is that my passion. Books are my passion. So I immediately went to see the books. While I'm looking at those books in many different languages, I saw a little, like a booklet, uh, not very attractive, very tiny, uh, the color, the cover is white. It says, Shakhsiyat Muhammad Min Tilkif, Important Personalities from Tilkif. I, I, I was stunned, what's this? Tilkif is a very neglected little village in Iraq. Nobody bother about it. Nobody care about the cave. And the people of the cave, they come to Baghdad and have loads of friends of them. I love them. They are really nice. They are childies. They speak their own language. In a way, I thought, okay, let's look at this book, see what it is. So I just pulled it up and opened it. It was written by um, a priest. I can't remember his name. So I start flipping into the, the, the pages. It says, it, it mentioned uh, personality from Tilkif, only clergymen. Majority of it is about clergymen and their contribution to Tilkif. And there only there was one name of a woman. So that what made me wonder, a woman, and her name, Marie Therese Asmar. I know the Asmar family in Baghdad, they are well-known family, but never mentioned, everybody mentioned anything about her. And in the in this booklet, it says, Marie Therese Esmer, in 18 something, didn't mention exact date. She was born 1804, that's the only date. And she went to Europe and she written two books for 750 pages. And in this book, she exaggerated about the size of her dad's house, which is, she says, is larger than the Louvre. That made me think, actually, I was so annoyed. So he mentioned 750 pages. Nothing attracted the priest, only she exaggerated about the size of her dad's house in Tilkev. Well, that's why I said, sorry to my friend, I need to have a computer. I need to go to the British Library online. I am a member there. So if I go there, I'll see if she's written book in English, it should be in the British Library. So I went to the computer very quickly. All the knobs I know, you know, click here, tick here, and, and write here, and write the name, write whatever. And there it comes on the screen. Marie Therese a smart books, two volumes. It's a British library. You can read it online or you can come and read it in the library. Not allowed to leave the British library. I said, when are we going back home? <laughs> and my friend said, you've just arrived. What? I said, I can't wait to see this two volumes, 750 pages. And I'll see what's in it. So from there, my journey with Mary Esmar started. That's how it started. You know, my journey with her started that at that point when you told me about her as well, because I was um, I attended 
your lecture because I was writing an article for the Chaldean News. Yeah, yeah. But in that. some instances, um, there has there's been very few times where the story that I cover becomes an yeah. important part of my life, yeah. and this was one of them for many yeah. many reasons because her life. Aside from her writing, because I was a writer, I, I still am, but yes. it seemed like it was something that was so foreign in our community, like you said, and to the care of this, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. Um, th there isn't the focus on particular figures, especially not women um, that I had never yeah. heard of, that both of my parents were born in Tilkev, and my father was a very educated man. But yeah. I had never heard of her. And as a writer, I felt so isolated and alone. And as someone who loved to travel the world, that also made me feel very isolated and alone because I was having desires and wants um, on a level that I felt like nobody can connect with. Yeah. And then yeah. I find a woman that was long before me had the same interest. And I thought, oh, my gosh, had I just yeah. known about her, I would have thought, like, this is not a big deal to have these kind of, uh, you know, ambitions and to, to follow you. Um, yeah your skills and your talents in that way. And um, you, there was so many interesting factors about her, about her mm -hmm. traveling alone. I mean, first of all, let's let's talk a little bit about who is Maria Teresa Esmar. And I wanna tell everybody uh, that we are having a lecture series that's kind of combined as a book club that will start um, online on September 10th. It's yeah. gonna be every other Saturday at yeah. 10 p.m for about an hour and a half. Um, mm -hmm. So the dates are September 10th and the 24th, October 8th and the 22nd, November 12th mm -hmm. and the 26th. And Emily is gonna be leading this book club, this lecture series. Um, and in it, we're gonna learn a, a, a great amount of information about that yes. region and about um, Teresa, Maria Teresa Esmar. But tell us briefly who she was, and then we'll go over some of the highlights of what we're going to be covering in the lecture series. Yeah, she comes from a, a family from Tilkev. She was born 1804 to a quiet, uh, affluent family, quite rich family. And because how, how you consider rich people at that time during the Ottoman Empire, because they had uh, loads of... Uh, uh, activities, social and uh, industrial and economical activities, like you could see, uh, they had uh, uh, something to do with the sheep selling and buying and, and cattle, and they have a, a factory for tahini, sesame paste, which now we find it in the, in the shops. And they had loads of land and for agriculture, so they produce lots of things. So that's her family. And she had uh, some priest and bishop in her family as well. And she talks about all the details, minute details about her, this little village. So she was, you know, capitalizing on some little things, what happened. <laughs> Oops, nothing, just, just one of my cats. <laughs> so, uh, so she was, the main aim of her in the book, I found, she just was determined to establish education institute for women. And she did that in Tilkev. It wasn't a problem as such, because during the Ottoman Empire, you couldn't do that. It wasn't allowed. Everything was run by the authority. And the authority didn't believe in um, diversity, didn't believe in other people writing their, you know, education or even speaking different languages, not Turkish languages, wasn't allowed. So I thought she managed to do that in Tilkev. That's what she did. And then she talks about so many different things and little things, how the house been, house has been built, how, how the people, what they wear, and uh, everything, you know. I said, how on earth? She noticed all, all this, you know, minute things. And then they went to Baghdad and she was born in the ruin of Nineveh because there was the plague. And they stayed in Baghdad a few years and then went back to Tilkiv. So she had very political understanding of political practice and social differences of that time. And, and she has, a, a, 
great passion for her country, for her village, for everybody. So she what she lived in very diverse society at that time in, in uh, well it is Iraq anyway. At that time, there was no uh, travel restrictions on people at, as long as they are part of the Ottoman Empire. So you could see people coming from all over, and um, Ottoman Empire was occupying loads, loads of the world at that time. So you could see people from uh, Iran coming, people from uh, from Europe coming because part of Europe was under the occupation. So she did have this knowledge and awareness of all these differences, all these people coming, and languages as well. So she managed to speak few languages because and, of her environment. And Emily, uh, from my observation and from my own research, I have found that a memoir is not really um, a, a popular thing in the Middle East. Popular meaning that most writers, that's not what they engage in. It's usually nonfiction or fiction. Um, yes. So for her to have written a memoir and a memoir of that size at that time was very yes. extraordinary. Because Absolutely. that's how we got the, the essence of really the lifestyle, like you said, and, and the details is when we yeah. really felt the details. essence. But she takes yeah. us in into yeah. the exact things of what was happening. Um, so I am really looking, I'm participating in this uh, book club, the yeah. lecture series, because in it, uh, she covers so many topics. So aside from her oh, yes. being yes. an interesting woman, you know, she yeah. life in Tilkif, like life in Baghdad. Uh, life in the desert with the Bedouins. Um, Absolutely. This is so interesting with the Bedouin. Yes, I love it. Love it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. We have this, you know, and uh, recently or modern time, people think the Bedouin aren't very kind or not very educated or the woman. But when she lived there, she gave us different picture. They are so kind. They are so lovely. They protected her. She had to live there because she started, um, she got a license to have a, a school for women in Baghdad, which is, was very difficult to get. And she she managed to work, uh, to help, to work with the British missionary. And she became very friendly with them. And this is the man who, in the missionary. So he, what he did, actually, he took that permission and change it under his name, under the missionary name. And she was betrayed and she was so angry and she was really devastated. So when she went to the Bedouin, they gave her all the kindness she needed, all the support. And she talks about so many details. She talked about all details everywhere. She lived in Lebanon. And if you go to the palace, you know, the palace of Amir Shahabi, I went there many times and so I saw her room where she lived and I saw all the details, all the minute details, she mentioned it. And when she traveled in the uh, ship from Cyprus to Europe, uh, what, what really interests me when she, when the, when ship, when the ship was in, in, in south of Italy, for, they had to go for a quarantine. They cannot, they are not allowed to just leave the ship and go wherever you want. They have to be in quarantine. The thing that really stunned her in a way said, the women are not covered, their faces. The women working with men together, there is no segregation of sex or gender in Italy. She said, How on earth? They are together in the streets. They are not covered, you know, she, they could talk. They could, we could see their hands. We could see that's what made her really couldn't believe it. And then from there, she went to meet the Pope and then she she stayed six months in the quarantine and she talked about details of the quarantine as well. And, and she, didn't the Queen of England, uh, did yeah, she yeah, sponsor yeah. her book? Yes, yes, project? she did, yes, yes. She went and met the Queen Victoria and uh, the elite people actually who are interested in the history of Mesopotamia you know, the Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, they did work with her because she is a good resource for them. She's a live resource. She could tell them a lot. And she did. And she did as well. Uh, and then she started writing her memoir and they helped her. They printed it. 
and it was very popular all over England. And always, I managed to get all the newspaper at that time, always mentioned in the newspaper at that time, still it's in the British Library. And then even in Europe as well, it was mentioned. So she was quite popular. And then she lost some of her, you know, money or what something happened. So she was bankrupt and it was in the newspaper as well. Everything about her was in the newspaper. She was famous everywhere else. And yes, yeah, she was a star. Outside, outside, of, her own, outside of her own yeah. people, interestingly, outside yeah, of her yeah, own she country. Was, she was. Yes. Which, yeah, these stories are common. But, you know, let's go back to your story now. So, yes. uh, so we are going to learn so much about her, but we're also going to learn about you because I think, like, what happened is, for my memory, is that once you learned about her, you started kind of following in her steps and then you started getting involved in her book. So tell us what that journey was like for you. Uh, it was it was hard. It wasn't easy. And to find more about her, because there isn't much about her in the Arab countries. There isn't much at all. And she was neglected in a way, nobody bothered about her. And so I have to dig and dig and dig to find whatever. So I managed to go to the uh, Shahabi Palace and I went to their record and I saw her name there as she was, um, uh, she was lady in waiting for the princess of uh, Lebanon at that time. She met many people and she mentioned all the people. One of the people she met, which is I managed again to discover and find what it was in India. It's Lady uh, Stanhope. She is a British woman and she was very interested in the Middle East. And she talks those about her. Here they consider her one of the top and the best um, uh, traveler or excavator per person. But she wasn't actually, she was there just to dig for fortune and to find very very expensive things to sell not not to study so this is one of things so i had to go to jordan and from jordan i had to go to lebanon and i went back to iraq i went to iraq i was going to go to til cave as well to see her grave and so i was ready to go i was very excited i might her I might find more about her in Til Cave. And then uh, I called the church over there. I was in Erbil and asked them, I'm coming. They said, no, don't come. We are occupied by Daesh. So that was really, really disappointing and very sad to me. But still, I managed to follow loads of her. Following her through the British newspaper was was the best way to find many about her. And Italy couldn't find much about her at all. And so I found a lot about her through the newspapers through, and through the book that was published in America. So they consider her one of the famous personality in that century. So they put her with a very famous book. So I, I managed to get that book, which is public 1927, I think. And uh, this book didn't give me much about her, just part of her memoir. And they just appraised her and they just said she was one of the most important personality at that time. So tracing her was difficult and the difficult things and the disappointing, I couldn't find many things about her in the Arab world, in Iraq, in Lebanon, anywhere at all. So, Nobody mentioned her. And that yeah, was maybe I that's why I start talking about her, giving lecture about her, whoever and and in wherever I work, wherever I travel. So she was very famous and popular. So her my translation of her book, I chose to translate something specific because she wanted the woman right, human right, education, and equality. That's what she, her emphasis was on, which is that what do we do now, isn't it? It's the same. So at that time, she was aware of that. 
So I traveled to so many different countries and, and I lectured about her. And uh, the book in Arabic been published five times by different publishers and still people wants to know about her. Uh, so in Egypt, they did an interview with the Egyptian television about her and I talked about her and nobody could believe what she's done. You know, the way she traveled, you know, with this caravan crossing the desert mm -hmm. for two or three months on a camel back, this is something, you know, it's so hard. And no man at that time, either from the Christian community or the other, have done something like what she's done. And then write about it, write a 700 pages yeah. more about yeah. it. So, you know, you remind me of, we, we are so grateful that you have done what you've done. The work that has really keeping her memory alive and uh, bringing her work, highlighting her work and bringing it up to surface. And you remind yeah. me of a woman, a professor, I forgot her name, but when they found the disc of Anhadwana, who was yeah. considered the first recorded writer in history, when, when they yeah. found that in ancient Iraq, there was a Western woman, um, once she realized that, she made it like her just life purpose to just write about Anhadwana, to travel everywhere, to let people know about her, yeah. to give lectures. Yeah. So yeah. as you were sharing that, I feel that you're representing that for Maria Teresa yeah. Asmar. So this is- Yeah, Anhadwana, it, it's the first, you know, women in, in the history of the globe, actually, to write mm -hmm. poems, you know. Right. Uh, unbelievable. And it was so unbelievable. And and the woman had, the, the woman, the Western uh, professor who f discovered what, when they, she, she heard about her, she dedicated her life to bringing her, you know, bringing yeah. recognition to her because she realized yeah. the importance. And it was that same attitude that you're sharing now that, how do people not know about this? This deserves so much attention. And, yeah. you know, we're lucky that you're doing this for Maria Teresa Esmar because she also has such an important role, but in a different area, in a different yeah. place, in a different time frame. So yeah. this book is very important in so many ways and really yeah. um, deserves the time and energy that we're going to be doing yeah. this. And I feel like it's going to be because of how your personality is. You're so open-minded. You have such an amazing uh, expertise and uh, adventurous life that I think uh, participating in it is also going to be a lot of fun. So yes. we encourage people to sign up. All you have to do is um, you can call 248-681-5050 uh, to register. You can send us an email at info at chaldeanculturalcenter.org. Um, there's various ways to find us. You can find us on our website. But really, it's, it's only like a couple of weeks away that we're going to start this. And I'm very excited about it. And any last words? We only have like two minutes left, uh, Emily. What are your last words about this? Well, in her book, you know, the two volume, it's not just talking about trouble. There is anecdotes. There is little stories. There is something funny. There is something sad. There is something kindness. There is a love in it. There is interest in it. So this is, that's why her book is a variety of things. It's not just a traveler talking about a travel. No. So I would like people to know what she was, how she was thinking. How, what she was enjoying and why she mentioned this and didn't mention that or whatever. So that's, I want people and her emphasis on women, on her women, on education, on equality, on diversity. And that's what we do now. So I want to introduce her to the people to recognize her effort at that time. We shouldn't forget it was during the Ottoman Empire. We shouldn't forget it wasn't there was any opportunity for her even to exist in the society because she she was very young and she managed to do it when I, I assume she was only 15 or 16 years old. Although she wanted to become a nun and she didn't, but there is many ways you know to remember her as well, not only from that point of view, from the other aspect of life that she's been through. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, again, I look forward to the book club. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.